Kitco News special coverage of Masari's annual Mainit Summit is brought to you by Oasis Pro. Hello, I'm Michelle Mahori and this is Kitco News coming to you from the Masari Mainet Conference in New York City. We are continuing our conversation with Mike Belshi, the CEO of Bitco. Bitco is one of the world's leaders in digital asset security and custody and the pioneer of multi-sig custody. All right, Mike, let's now focus on this new venture between you and Swan Bitcoin to launch the USA's first Bitcoin-only trust. Still in the early stages, but tell us about that. Well, we haven't quite launched it yet. We, we've announced it. Look, for, for some time, we've been thinking about if you were to pull out all the stops on a Bitcoin-centric custodial product where we can use time-locked transactions in ways that, you know, you can't really secure assets uh, kind of in a cross-chain type of way, equivalently. If you can use some of the features around recovery vaults and things like that, there's been a lot of interesting innovations down in the low levels of Bitcoin around Bitcoin scripts for how you would protect very large amounts of digital asset. I did a talk, I think it's been about four years now, which was called Securing the Trillion Dollar Wallet. And, you know, look, we're, we don't have a trillion dollars in digital assets right now, but that's the security level we need to be planning for. You know, when we started in 2013, $10 million wallets were pretty big. And then by 2015, we had $100 million wallets, $1 billion wallets we started seeing by 2017. So we need to be prepping for that. And Bitcoin is gonna be the large value lock, it's our prediction. So can we build just a completely superior way to secure those very large uh, Bitcoin uh, holdings? And I think we can. BitGo has over, what, 900 digital assets? And it's... I don't know. It's probably even larger than that. <laughs> so is the need to separate Bitcoin from the other assets based on demand from Swan Bitcoin, which is a pure Bitcoin player, no other altcoins at all whatsoever, or is it because you foresee very different regulatory hurdles for other assets, considering that Bitcoin pretty much established, I think safe to say, as a commodity and not as a, as a security? I think regulators and custodians are pretty aligned. Don't lose the client's money. The job is you give me the Bitcoin, you come back, you want it back, I give it back. And we do some reporting on top of it, make sure that like it's all bona fide transactions. It's a pretty easy to agree upon job for everyone. So there's no regulatory issue that we're trying to solve here. But by building a Bitcoin specific custodial option, we can really take um, optimizations that we haven't been able to do when it's a cross chain way. So we will continue to operate the cross chain uh, trust companies, but we're gonna add in this Bitcoin only component and it's really about planning for security. I think security of digital assets, that's our job. You know, it happens to be completely aligned with the regulators. And when you plan for like what's coming next, of course we have to be going to this type of level. All right, I know this uh, plan to launch the first Bitcoin Early Trust with Swan is very recently hatched, I'm still awaiting approval. But have you seen any signs of demand for this yet? Do you anticipate a lot of demand? Yeah, just look on Twitter. I mean, there's been lots for a long time. It's not like this is new. Look, I think there was a little bit of reaction there. Like Swan had a need that they needed to solve and this kind of fits with their ethos. Um, but in terms of like the idea about doing a Bitcoin specific trust company, um, that's not there. So really what we've done is kind of accelerated those plans and said, look, let's use this as a time to make it happen. Okay, well, I've had the pleasure of interviewing Corey Klipstein of Swan and a number of the Swan guys. And we know that they are Bitcoin maxis, right? They are Bitcoin purists. They do not believe in any other cryptocurrencies other than Bitcoin, thinking that Bitcoin is superior. Do you share that view? Do you see Bitcoin as a the superior cryptocurrency? Look, I do see Bitcoin as superior, but not at the exclusion of any future innovation. Like at the end of the day, what are we doing? We're trying to create a form of money, which is a tool, which is better than the forms of money we've had before. And do you really believe that there's never gonna be a better form of money ever? But what if you had something that was exactly like Bitcoin, had all the properties of Bitcoin, but had privacy as well? Privacy is a problem for Bitcoin. Like, could we have that? I think we could. What if you didn't have- What about uh, Monero? What is that one, the privacy coin? 
Sure, I but, mean, but it's missing some of the, the Bitcoin elements. Look, I, I, I don't want to get into like a nitpick about what is Monero or what's not. My point is, you know, innovation happens. And the idea that the first version of a piece of software is the last version of a piece of software, when is it that you wanted to buy version 1.0 and never get an upgrade? So look, some people might hear this and say, oh, he wants to change Bitcoin. Come on, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm talking about. Bitcoin is fantastic. It's clearly head and shoulders above what pretty much any of the other blockchains are in terms of its offering around value, storage, store value and whatnot. But I think that we should all have hope that actually we will come up with even better systems in the future and we will like them even more. And it's not gonna kill Bitcoin. It's gonna be ways that we make the tooling, which is how we account for money, better, more inclusive, more available, more robust, more decentralized, all those things. So if you see Bitcoin as the first version and you are saying that you anticipate better version that's out there, I mean, what would that mean for the whole store of value argument of Bitcoin? Well, look, monetary systems can cycle and change. And the idea that you've got one that's never going to change, I'm not, not sure why we would want that. What we want is a good store of value that persists. And if something else comes along that starts to get better, you know, the, the, the use of the store of value may shift. It probably wouldn't be like a turn one off and turn the other one on. It would probably be more of a, a gradual migration. But um, I, don't, I don't fundamentally don't understand why this is such tissue rejection for Bitcoin maxis. Like, there's no reason to be afraid of future improvements. But why invest your fiat in Bitcoin and your time and effort in Bitcoin if in 50 years time, even sooner, Bitcoin isn't the number one store of value, right? That, I guess that's the argument. If Bitcoin is not seen as the ultimate store of value asset, the purest form of money, the real sound money, what is and why invest your funds in that if it's well, going to be replaced? You're talking like the technologist here who loves your technology and just wants the technology to win. I'm talking about like what's the best way that we build a great financial system and store money and value? And it's a tool. The technology is a tool to get there. It's not the end zone. People don't care about what the technology of Bitcoin is. They want the best form of money. So, of course, if we have a better form of money, people would want to use it. And I don't think people should be afraid of that. But if we're looking at Bitcoin as a way to store value of our current efforts within this current monetary system, right? Spent so many years working, saving up in fiat, which has been debased and devalued due to the monetary policies that we're looking to change. And if we're putting that into Bitcoin and you're saying that you don't necessarily see Bitcoin surpassing other currencies in a way that negates the argument that Bitcoin is a good store of value. No, no, no. Bitcoin is the best form of money we've ever had, but it doesn't mean that it's going the best, the best form of money that we ever will have, right? So I don't, again, I don't see why people should be so caught up on this point. Um, Bitcoin is building a network effect today and it's growing. It's going to be very hard to displace. Like, let's use Amazon as an example. Amazon is incredibly entrenched and so many links and knowledge of Amazon. You could build a much better form of Amazon. Maybe everybody agrees it's got everything you need, but it's really hard to supplant Amazon just because it's so big. The network effect carries a lot of value. And Bitcoin could end up there where the network effect carries the value and it makes it really hard to replace. All that means is you're not gonna replace Bitcoin with something that's only a little bit better. It's gonna have to be materially better in order to replace Bitcoin. Um, and someday that'll come. By the way, I did the HTTP 2.0 product, right, yeah. protocol. And prior to HTTP 2.0, we had HTTP 1.1. It had been around for 15 years. And when we were trying to get people started on, we called it speedy in the early days, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a real protocol. You know, people like, ah, Mike, that's never gonna work. Ah, Microsoft will never use it. Ah, we'll have to replace too much stuff. And the answer was always like, look, if people don't want to use it because it's too hard to shift to it, it just means we didn't make it good enough. And we have to make it good enough that it warrants all those switching costs. So if there's no form of money that comes that's better than Bitcoin that would warrant those switching costs, they won't switch. But technology just kind of has this way of having a version two. I don't know if it's uh, 50 years or 100 years or 200 years. I think it's quite likely we will see something that's significant, uh, some significant change eventually. That is better than Bitcoin. 
but in, from an investor's point of view, and I know you were also instrumental with working on Netscape, which was once the leader, soon to be replaced by Google Chrome, which you worked on as well. So from an investor's point of view, um, does it make sense then to feel comfortable and confident putting money in Bitcoin, again, as a store of value, if you see that being replaced by a better, superior store of value as the technology evolves? Of course it does. Like, okay, so the... I don't think the browser analogy holds here at all. All right, so let's say I bought Amazon stock, right? Um, it still hasn't been replaced, but um, well, let's say, I mean, I don't think you could buy MySpace stock, but for argument's sake, let's say that Bitcoin is like the MySpace and you invested in MySpace that obviously got replaced by Facebook, which is now replaced by other social media companies. If we use those metaphors, um, does it make sense to buy equity, invest in the first product and hold it for the long term? Well, let's use seeing... a different example. Let's use Tesla and GM and Ford, right? So we've got internal combustion engines versus electric vehicles. And look, people are liking the electric vehicles. They think they're better for the environment. People like the Tesla products, you know, not everybody loves it. But well, yeah, no, not everybody they've likes done really them, well. that's for sure. And, you know, some of those older companies are having a hard time keeping up. They're having a hard time keeping up on costs and the way they do labor and the way they do distribution and all that. And there's newer companies doing better. So look, there's going to be an evolution there. Um, again, like, it's not something that just one day GM is gone and Tesla takes everything that they had. No, these things evolve. And Bitcoin is not going to disappear. You can totally put your money in it right now. There's nobody even close on the horizon to changing this. But the thought that there never will be either, look, I don't think that's right. It's like saying, hey, the US dollar is going to be the one last true currency for the world. Now, there's probably some people in DC that think that that's true. I don't think that's true. Do you think that's true? Well, we why know would you that put your money in dollars right now? You think it's going to be replaced by something else? Well, that's why people put their money in Bitcoin and gold, because they see that every traditional reserve currency has lost its value over time as man has debased it. I mean, yeah, if you look at the life cycle of a reserve currency, we know that the dollar will eventually lose power if history has taught us anything. I mean, I always like to say that there was a time when the Portuguese escuda was the world's largest uh, reserve currency when the Portuguese empire was, was ruling the globe. And clearly that's not the case anymore. Much older than you look. <laughs> good, uh, good skincare <laughs> and uh, a good student of history. But no, I certainly wasn't around back then. But in, in terms of where you, what would you say to the naysayers that say Bitcoin is going to go away? It is a bubble. I mean, it sounds like you're not necessarily negating that argument. No, no, no. Digital assets are here to stay. Bitcoin is the best type of money we've ever seen. There's no, there's no turning back on that. People need it. Look, I think that money does get to a fundamental human right. You should have the, you, you, you toil away at your labors, you earn money, you get to save that. It keeps its value and eventually you spend it on your kids or your housing or your food or whatever is important to you. The, the, the monies that are debased take this right away from people. And we see that in the last 12 months, right? So as the US started cranking up interest rates, dollar gets stronger, Argentina goes down, Venezuela goes down, Turkey goes down. The people in those areas now start to see inflation at such levels that the, the storage of their last 20 years of wealth is gone. Look, this has to be fixed. Um, by the way, those people, what did they turn to? Some of them turned to Bitcoin. A number of them turned to Tether. Why did they turn to Tether? Well, anytime you have, yes, anytime you have these inflationary cycles, you tend to see a few things happen. First, the inflation happens. Second, the people start moving to the US dollar, something that they understand, dollars easy to understand. The government realizes, wait, if they move to the US dollar, I lose my power and hyperinflation gets even worse. And the government comes in and bans the use of the US dollar. Now you have a black market. Now you have two prices, the government's price and the price that everybody knows the real price is. Of course, the people continue to use the dollar because they need to store their value. And then eventually the government's like, ah, okay, and they allow the dollar back in, the whole thing just kind of explodes and has to reset. Um, the same thing is happening right now in a few different places. And it's not necessarily easy to go to Bitcoin right now, so they're looking to go to dollar. It's just people have this need to save value. And as Bitcoin gets more plumbed through, as Bitcoin becomes more accessible, people will start to use it. Um, yeah. But you don't necessarily see 
Bitcoin as that store value in a hundred years time? I don't know. <laughs> you don't know either. I certainly don't know. That's why I'm asking you. Look, I, I, I think it's so it's so extreme to say like either you have, you think Bitcoin's a store of value that'll last forever, or you say a hundred years time. That's not forever. Okay. Yeah. Like I think there will be upgrades. Uh, yes, I, I you do. Think there and, will be and again, I don't think people need to be afraid of that. Um, I think we will preserve the scarcity. Nobody's going to come in and like change the supply. The biggest value that we have with Bitcoin is it taught us we can create a fixed supply currency and we can create one that's got a, a patterned distribution cycle with the, with the block reward and all that. So, all right. All right. Well, seeing as I'm asking you to make four costs, yeah. um, as we start to wrap up here, as we discussed before, you were instrumental in launching Web1, working on Netscape, and then as an engineer that has, what, 10 patents, you also were instrumental in Google Chrome, which is obviously the superior browser. Now you're working on Web3 with crypto and DeFi. Netscape was what uh, we said earlier, 25 years ago? 1995. 1995. Almost 30, yeah. Almost 30. So we'll keep it within that time frame. Where do you see digital assets, cryptocurrency, financial markets in 30 years time? Look, I think the Web 1, Web 2, Web 3 uh, classification is a bit of revisionist history. Um, I mean, of course, we did have the first iteration of the web and um, Netscape really pushed a lot of that. The natural outcome of that was we ended up with these big powerhouses, data, uh, Google and Facebook and others that have large amounts of our data that they've amassed. That creates a natural need to kind of figure out how, how do we take that back and control it a little, better, a little bit better. But then I think when it comes to finance markets and digital properties, I mean, they're related and we can see them both being solved with, with blockchain type solutions, but they're not the same. I'm much more interested in the financial system and starting to use technology to fix the transparency, eliminate the risk and making it fair and open all. I, that's what what I get excited about most. Now, the digital property is looking kind of interesting too, right? Hey, this art that you can now own. Back in the 90s, you know, we had digital rights management. Microsoft had to do it and like you couldn't copy DVDs and all this stuff. We didn't know how to deal with that very well. Now we have much better models. And so I think there's some interesting things coming out. Interestingly here, the SEC just came down on Stoner Cats, which you saw this one? Yeah. Okay, Stoner Cats is uh, doing NFTs to like make videos of entertainment art. And they came down on it and said they sold the security. Um, and it's a very interesting fine line where if you really want to start classifying lots of things as securities, you could probably say that baseball cards are securities. I bought them as a kid for an investment of money, hoping they'd go up and it depends on tops and Don Rust to not print too many cards. Like now they're saying when it comes to digital, that's a security. And yet for like, the manual printed stuff, it wasn't. Why not? Arbitrary and capricious, I'd say. But look, we'll sort through this. Anyway, that's a, a separate section from the financial segment. When it comes to Web3, I think they're more talking about kind of digital property ownership. I get more excited about the financial system. And what do you see the financial system like in 20 years time? You've said that you see software eating into traditional finance. I believe that's quoting you correctly. Yeah. So if you could paint me a picture, yeah, what, right. what do you think that looks like in 20 years time? Well, like the financial crisis that we had, we really couldn't tell you know, who had the assets and who didn't, right? So 2008, all of a sudden there's this liquidity crunch because everybody's looking at each other saying, I'm not giving you any money, right? So blockchains can tease this apart and we can now start to see transparently who actually has it. Now there's more that has to happen, right? Like yeah. the things that are going on with rehypothecation and other, other ways of abusing assets, which you and I think are being held safely and securely, and yet they're being levered out. There's other things that have to happen. We don't have, Bitcoin doesn't solve that by itself, right? Um, so anyway, there's, there's a lot more to be done, but we can, we can reduce risk, we can increase transparency, and then you and I can decide to participate in a system that's completely understandable only by us without having to have all this trust on third parties. And that's all new. That's gonna make it a lot safer for us. All right, final thought. Tell us about the latest venture from BitGo. Well, lately we're working on the Go network. Um, look, I think when you look at BitGo's evolution, the first phase was about delivering trust by way of having a secure 
wallet platform. People were getting hacked, people were losing, like the multi-sig component was really a pioneer. How do you just get the technology right? The second thing we needed was for businesses, we needed to be able to have segregated assets away from the business and, and the client, you know, build the custodian, the regulated elements here. Fiduciaries want to work with the fiduciary, so we had to build that. The third thing we're doing is building market structure. And, you know, most people don't know how trading and markets work. But look, trading and markets are really important for the economy. It's how we all participate together. And we need to isolate the risks that are being taken on the trading infrastructure. That's really what the separation of the exchange and the clearinghouse and the custodian and the bank is really all about. So there's traders and brokers that take lots of risk. But this middle part, which is the exchange component, needs to be really uh, limited amounts of risk. So what we're building right now with Go Network is a settlement platform. It's really like a clearinghouse, but better. It starts to use digital asset technology behind the scenes, um, allows us to understand how the money's moving and connect the world. All right, well, we're looking forward to seeing that and looking forward to chatting to you again soon, hopefully at Pacific Bitcoin. But great catching up with you at Masari Mainnet. Mike, thank you so much. Mike Belshi. Great to see you. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate so it. Thank you. Kitco News special coverage of Masari's annual Mainnet Summit is brought to you by Oasis Pro.